Dr. William Ray at the Environmental Health Center. Dr. Ray is truly a pioneer in environmental health. And Dr. Ray, if you'll just tell us a little bit about your credentials, please. Well, I'm a cardiovascular surgeon and uh, I was a trauma surgeon at Parkland Hospital for years. And uh, I had a son who almost died uh, and they wanted to put him on steroids and a whole bunch of other toxics. And uh, I said, no, there has to be a better way. And uh, uh, the pulmonologist uh, uh, said, uh, well, you think you're so smart, you figure it out yourself. And I said, you son of a bitch, I will. <laughs> so Dr. Ray, how long have you been practicing? About 40 years. And how long have you been subject to abuses from the Texas Medical Board? Well, you know, I, I can't even remember. I think it was before Gus and, and uh, some of the other people, but for around uh, uh, 20, uh, 206, yeah. About? 2006. 2006. Mm -hmm. So about 10 years also. Yeah, but, right. Exactly. Oh, so that's kind of interesting that that's yeah. kind of. And uh, it was quite interesting because uh, they had uh, complained that there were five patients, surprisingly all from Manhattan, New York, and uh, all satisfied patients uh, that we'd gotten better. And, what was uh, their original cause? What did what was the, on your notice? Uh, I don't even recall at the uh -huh. time, uh, but uh, original notice was that uh, so there had been a complaint filed. So I called uh, each patient, and they were outraged uh, because they'd been helped. And uh, one was a PhD, and I said, "Well, can you uh, send me the letter they sent you?" because they had sent them letters and she said no i was so mad i threw it, threw it in the waste uh, right away and uh, so uh, we went down and uh, had the uh, quote or whatever it is informal hearing i'm not sure what they called it at the time mm -hmm. and my examiner was a, uh, uh, a gp from uh, the uh, boons ox in texas who later we found out was on salary at Blue Cross, and uh, mm. that uh, we had uh, we reached an agreement with them uh, because uh, uh, there were a couple things that uh, I hadn't disclosed that some of our antigens were uh, made from things like diesel fuel and and uh, uh, solvents, so. Uh, I agreed. It made sense to me that I hadn't informed them uh, of that, and so we always have signed, had patients sign that from there on. Now, in that because you're checking to see if they're reactive to those. Yes. Yeah. Because, you're they, not giving people those those no, solvents. Right. You're checking to see if they're reactive to them. That's right. Because yes. more people are reactive to certain chemicals than others. That's exactly right. Like for example, formaldehyde, jet fuel. Uh, toluene, siren, and so on. And once again, it was not that you were giving patients these toxins, it's just part of the allergic evaluation to determine the sensitivity level of the patients you're receiving. That's right. And of course, uh, that also gives a measure of proof that if they're working around these substances, then maybe they shouldn't be. Uh, yes, you might be able to neutralize them, but also they probably shouldn't be that. And sometimes uh, natural gas in the house uh, bothered them and uh, they'd have to change the stove or whatever. So anyway, uh, we went on after that and uh, I uh, subsequently have written probably 150 scientific patients and uh, 10 textbooks on this. Uh, 150 scientific papers That's correct. and 10 textbooks. That's correct. 10 textbooks. Now, uh, on the impact on the human body from environmental in, uh, toxins. That's right. And, and of course, uh, as the publisher told me uh, this last time when I turned in my final two books, they'd never seen so many references because uh, the, the, the accusation that these people are not uh, having any science behind them and there's no data is just pure nonsense. It's, it's in the scientific literature, 
and uh, it tells mm -hmm. it right there. And these uh, hypersensitivities are well worked out now. It has uh, people that are have a, a, some overload of say, let's say, of jet fuel. If they uh, uh, get this overload and their body can't tolerate it much, it combines with a substance called protein kinase, one and three, and uh, when it's phosphorylated, it makes uh, their whole system hypersensitive uh, up to a thousand times. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, it's cumulative. It, well, it's, it's amazing that with cancer, with allergies, that so many doctors, they see the symptom, they immediately take the allopathic route, we're going to give you this drug to treat this. They don't ask the question, why do you think you got cancer, or why, or at what point did you start having this allergy? No, that's true, and that, that has to be part of the history always. And and uh, if if you can find something like I had a lawyer tell, uh, tell me uh, uh, two weeks ago, there's no evidence that welding ever hurt anybody. <laughs> <laughs> high high electromagnetic fields around welding. Well, yes. and also In the off all the fumes. Off guessing, yes. All the fumes, okay. And if you look at the literature. It's that high on the welding in disease, okay? So always have to uh, find, look for the cause and try to eliminate it. Uh, I'm a surgeon, so therefore I know that if I've got a wound, the last thing I do is rub dirt in it. And I don't think there's anybody in this room or anybody in America that believes you should rub dirt in a wound. We, we know that. It's common sense. Well, I, I think the other thing that's important to point out is, is that, in essence, too often we have doctors that treat the uh, symptoms. Yes. And what you're looking to do is treat the underlying cause. Right. And I don't, I don't have any problem treating the symptoms, but you got to look for the cause, too. Exactly. Is the whole and, and what's so ironic today is we have one doctor, Dr. Castanis, that when he made the assertion that nutrition could help your body, as you make the assertion that these chemical toxins could be detrimental to the body, yes. you get harassed for that, that well, stance. Well, uh, I get kind of criticized for it, put it that way. <laughs> I uh, have had some detractors, but I've lectured all over the world in uh, august medical societies and universities and uh, uh, other uh, places. And it's known as chemical sensitivity. Or electromagnetic hypersensitivity. Yes, that, Certain that. sensitivities, uh, allergy sensitivities, uh, to, to people could move into new homes, had never had a problem, but because they have formaldehyde in all the cabinets uh, and the carpet, their health starts going down. That's right. They go to regular doctors, they just treat it as the symptom rather than saying, oh, you moved into a new house? Does it have yeah. new carpet? Do you have new adhesive in your new vinyl flooring? No one's looking for anything other than what the symptom is. Well, I think in the last 30 years, we've gotten over to the public that right. uh, the environment can influence you and can cause disease problems. The problem is if uh, you know, we could get the profession, and only some groups, we have many medical societies now that teach this. Uh, the Academy of Environmental Medicine, the Pan American Allergy, which uh, has been in Texas for years and years, uh, teach these things. Are you still being, I mean, do they bring up cases? Do you have any idea how many any um, complaints or investigations you have to go through? Uh, to my uh, knowledge, I haven't gone through any more investigations. Uh, but I don't know what's happened underneath the table, okay? Mm -hmm. And what did it cost you to go through that? How long did that drag out? It cost me a million three hundred thousand. And had I not been a cardiovascular surgeon uh, in a previous life, I could have never afforded it. I would have been knocked out of uh, practice. But you won. I won. Yeah. Well, I yeah. I, and by and you, you, another interesting thing was is that. My examiner resigned suddenly uh, after we brought some of this out, and the president of the board was found to uh, be uh, trying to knock down her competitor in town, and she resigned. Right. Yes, we've had instances like that on the medical board where they found conflicts of interest 
uh, here these people are exercising authority and have the ability to uh, cause a great deal of financial harm uh, to doctors out there and we find out that the ones who are doing this very often have a conflict of interest. But I believe the most egregious one with Dr. Ray was a case was filed against him and it was based on what he had done 30 years before. And in essence, what ended up happening was uh, initially, the, uh, I, based on the information I was able to obtain from open records, I found that initially the board said, well, we can't prosecute this because it's more than 30 years old. And, but they nonetheless moved forward. They had him come down, do an informal settlement conference. And at the end of the informal settlement conference, which I set in on, they said, well, you know, we believe you violated the standard of care, but the case is 30 years old, so we're not going to do anything. Now, they knew it was 30 years old from the get-go, and yet they knew all along exactly what they were going to do. The deal is, how much did that case cost you, Dr. Ray? Well, I, that's was included in this. Oh, okay. $1,300,000. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, this, so... But this is... Uh, to me, that's not the issue, even though I'm, I was broke, okay, <laughs> after that. Uh, to me, the issue was, why should the average uh, doc be hit for something that they did that are trying to help somebody that didn't hurt them? Why should they have to pay anything? And why, more important, why wouldn't they be uh, congratulated for trying to, mm -hmm. to follow the Hippocratic Oath of Dr. Casanas's uh, original country <laughs> there, you know? And, you know, what's very interesting is, is there are always some vested interests that go along. And right now, the big thing is mold never hurt anybody. And yet, so many houses are, are moldy, and so many buildings are moldy, okay? And we know it's hurt somebody. And if you go back, they say there's no literature. Well, that's just pure bunk. And, and uh, it's, you know what's interesting about that? All you have to do is look and see what insurance companies want to cover. That's mm -hmm. it. And right that's now, exactly it. they are exempting mold from household coverage. Yeah. Which so is, you got to watch the insurance mycotoxins. companies. Yes, mycotoxins. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very well researched and stated. And so, Dr. Ray, of the members of the Texas Medical Board, how many members were qualified to evaluate the type of treatment options that you're exercising here in Apparently your Apparently, there were none. <laughs> that, so that was the problem. That's why I the reviewer was the insurance worked for the insurance. But company. here's the kicker: Dr. Ray is also a professional witness in court, in courts of law, and has been for a long time. So it, attacking him is attacking the system itself because right. he I'm is, he is a professional that up that witness. Work at work, 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 work comps. Some of these people have justified workman's comp, and some of the insurance company won't pay for them. And uh, particularly the state of Louisiana seems to be the worst on this, although Texas is a problem also. And uh, you have to realize uh, that uh, uh, we, if we don't innovate, we have dead patients or we have crippled patients all the time. Well, the question is, what's happened to Texas? I mean, I came to Texas because I couldn't stand the cold uh, of Ohio. But the other reason was because oh, this was the innovation of vascular surgery. Mm -hmm. DeBakey and Cooley and all the groups were uh, innovating when they weren't at Ohio State. Right. I can tell you that. They were in the case being done. And so, and that was true throughout uh, many of the northern areas there, you know. And so uh, what I wonder is why did we suddenly adapt all this uh, nonsense of of uh, innovation. Why do we want anti-innovation? Right. Doesn't well, make sense. And I think that's the important point. At the very bedrock of innovation, you have to have freedom. If you don't have freedom, you won't have that's innovation. Right. And so, uh, because everybody gets st stuck back on the, oh, this is what the standard of care is, this is what the, uh, the, the herd is using, and you have no room for people on the cutting edge. Right. We're going to go after them. What that does is kill innovation because it kills freedom. That's right. I've been told that when it comes to U.S. medicine, if you're injured, 
we are the best. We have the innovation, there's new procedures, there's new equipment used to help rebuild the body. But when it comes to disease management, we are locked into a 30 year old standard of care that is predominantly prescription, pharmaceutically based. Right. Symptom based instead of cure based. Yeah, exactly. Symptom, yes. Well, the thing we should be asking uh, our detractors are what is the standard of care? Mm -hmm.